Hello and welcome to the second part of Oddtober, where we're going to be taking a look at all of the main entries in the Oddworld series. Last time we took a look at Oddworld Abe's Odyssey, and now it only makes sense to move on to the second game released in the series, Oddworld Abe's Exodus, the direct sequel to that original game. So, what are we waiting for? Let's get on with it! Just like Abe's Odyssey, Abe's Exodus is a 2D cinematic platformer where you play as Abe, a Madokan who was formerly a slave at Rupture Farms. After the events of the first game, Abe has destroyed Rupture Farms and rescued 99 Madokans from their abuse at the hands of the tyrannical Gluckans in control of the facility. This game picks off exactly where the first game left off, showing Abe teleporting onto a stage and everyone celebrating his victory. He farts and Big Face, a shaman from the previous game who sends Abe on his spiritual journey, jokingly slaps him on the back. Not expecting this, Abe falls off of the stage, knocking himself unconscious and having a vision where three ghosts inform him that the remains are being desecrated by the Gluckans in a location called Necrum. Madokan slaves are being used to mine for bones for an unspecified purpose, and this is not only causing unrest for the Madokan spirits, but it's also not too great for the living Madokans either. In order to keep this mining operation a secret, the Madokan miners have all had their eyes stitched shut, resulting in them becoming blind. And all of this is to hide what the Gluckans are up to, but also so that the slave workers don't become unincentivized to work due to them digging up their own ancestors' bones. This scene where the blind Madokans are revealed to us always used to creep me out. You can just imagine the pain they had to go through to have this process done to them. They use Budokan slaves to do it. Blind ones that couldn't see. Abe is spurred into action to stop Necrom Mines, rescue the Madokans there, and stop the desecration of this once sacred burial site. To get there though, he needs to trek across a harsh desert, and rather than going alone, he takes a few friends with him. At first the trip is going well, but eventually the other Madokans begin losing motivation. Just as they're about to give up, they're surprised by a train rolling past that's transporting bones, letting them know they're close. With uplifted spirits, the Madokans find Necrom Mines and break in, only for Abe to fall down a pit, and then the game begins. What I like about the story this time around is that there's quite a bit more mystery involved. Whereas in Abe's Odyssey we already know what's at stake from the first cutscene, and ultimately we know what happens to Abe because of the majority of the game being a flashback, in Exodus, we don't know at this stage why the Madokan bones are being dug up, and how deep this adventure will eventually take us. We don't even know what the ultimate goal is, other than shutting down the mines, that is. And I like this because it gives a lot more room for plot development. I also love how the game picks up literally exactly where the first game left off, which makes this game almost feel like part two of the same game, rather than being a new game altogether. I've always thought that Abe's Odyssey and Exodus are incomplete without playing through both of them, and I think that's because there's no disconnect between the two titles. There's no time jump or anything to make us question what else has happened, and I like that. The first section of the game takes place in Necrom Mines, and almost instantaneously we're introduced to an absolute ton of brand new game mechanics that weren't present in Abe's Odyssey. Despite using the same game engine and feeling the same to control, Exodus adds in a ton of layers on top of that original experience that gives this game far more variety, but also makes the experience a lot more user-friendly too. Just a few of the quality of life improvements this game makes is the fact that you can now talk to more than one Madokan at a time and get them to follow you all at once. Madokans will now follow you off of ledges automatically without having to say follow me constantly, Madokans can be told to work, which makes it so you can freely choose which Madokan you want to talk to if you need to move them one at a time, but also means that you can make Madokans interact with certain objects in the game, which is used in some very creative puzzles later in the game. Save in the game also no longer has to create a brand new save file, and you can instead choose to overwrite your existing one instead. However, what I will say about this is that I highly recommend that you do create new save files, because yet again the game offers no way of backtracking to earlier levels, and it doesn't have a level select feature. 
So if you miss anything, you're either completely locked out of getting 100% or you'll have to go back to an earlier save. I would recommend that you make a new save file at the start of every new area of the game, just so you can revisit past areas if you need to as a backup. This came in handy for me on multiple occasions. I actually think this game could have been designed almost like a metroidvania, where you can freely explore the entire game's world without being locked out of any locations. Which I appreciate would have made the game feel quite a lot different and required a lot of tweaking, but I think it could have worked extremely well. Perhaps the two biggest changes to this game that make it much, much more user-friendly than the original game though, are the fact that this game offers a quick save mechanic where you can pause the game and select the quick save option, which basically acts as a manual checkpoint that you can create infinitely and whenever you want. I was going into this thinking that this mechanic would be extremely overpowered and make the game far too easy, However, the design of this game is substantially different to Odyssey, and not only features much more complex and difficult puzzles, but it's also got a far greater emphasis on platforming and fast-paced timed sequences, where you either don't have time to quick save, or quick saving could result in messing up puzzles and forcing you to restart the entire section. They did an extremely good job in changing the design approach with quicksave in mind, because I feel like if this feature was in Abe's Odyssey, it would potentially make the game too easy, because that game's puzzles and platforming are a lot more deliberate, and give you time to think and plan ahead most of the time. It's a great mechanic that stops you getting irritated by replaying the same sections of levels over and over again, and completely eliminates the issue I had with Abe's Odyssey's unreasonable checkpoint placements. The second really major addition to Abe's Exodus is the fact that secret areas are no longer way too hidden to find without constantly rolling into walls or falling down pits just to see if anything's there. And instead, secrets are subtly signposted by having Soulstorm brew bottles lying around on screen whenever there's a secret on that particular screen. This means if you're observant enough, you wouldn't need to look up a guide to find everything, which is an amazing change. Something else that makes hunting down the secrets slightly easier is the upgraded Madokan tally chart where it not only says the total number of Madokans in the area and how many have died, like in Odyssey, but it also says how many Madokans are in this one particular level, and even includes the ones hidden in secret areas. Meaning that it's obvious if you've missed something, and means you can backtrack to find everything, if you want to. If I were to criticise this though, I would say, I wish the total number of Madokans in the overall area went down as you collected them, because this would make it much easier to track if you have them all, especially later in the game. And also, Madoc and Tally charts should have been available in every area of the game, because in certain areas, there's no chart, but there are hidden areas hiding Madokans, meaning you could very, very easily miss stuff here and be completely unaware until you get to the end of the game and see you're missing some. Still though, I appreciate that the Tally charts have at least a bit more detail, which is handy for if you're a completionist. Wow, that was a hell of a lot to get through, and remember, literally all of this is introduced to us at the first part of the game. So not only do we have all of the original mechanics returning, like possession, platforming, and game speak, but we also have all of this other stuff layered on top too. What's interesting though, is that it never feels particularly overwhelming. The game does a great job of introducing these things very organically through the first section of the game, and to be honest, I do feel like it's expected that you've played the first game before this one, with it being a direct continuation. But still, if this was your first Oddworld game, I don't feel like you would have struggled to get the basics down, despite there being a lot to take in. Anyway, Abe eventually catches up with his friends from earlier, who he broke into the mines with, and they come across a vending machine for a drink called Soulstorm Brew. Abe's friends start down in drink after drink, despite Abe's warning that something seems suspicious about the situation. The Madokans then quickly become sick and seemingly addicted to the brew, wanting more even after the vending machine has run out. Abe looks at an empty bottle and discovers that the drink is made with Madokan bones, hence why the Gluckans are so intent on digging up Madokan burial sites. 
He's forced to leave his friends behind as a flying slig approaches the area and spots Abe after recognising him from a wanted poster. So the task is to now not only stop Necron Mines, but also save Abe's friends from their brew sickness and addiction. But at the moment, we don't really know how to do that, so Abe presses on to find answers. The basic level design in these upcoming sections are testing your knowledge of the mechanics established in Abe's Odyssey, while also stepping things up and exploring mechanics that were perhaps a little bit underutilised in the first game. Things like throwing rocks, motion sensors, possessing sligs, stealth, and using game speak to rescue Madokans are all used for some great moments, but sprinkled in here are even more new mechanics. Firstly, we have a new inhabitant to the Oddworld universe in the form of the aforementioned flying sligs. These are the normal sligs we're all used to seeing, only instead of mechanical legs, they have propeller packs and grenade pouches, allowing them to fly and drop bombs below them. Obviously, this makes for some intense chases, and you sometimes have to outmaneuver them to evade their attacks. But what's so cool about these is that Abe can possess them and make use of their abilities. These flying slig sections often involve you avoiding lines of sights with other sligs and bombing them so Abe can traverse safely through the area. And they're also used in obstacle course sections where you need to move quickly and use timing to get through unscathed to uncover a secret or progress through the level. It's awesome stuff and gives you a gameplay style that's completely different to anything from Abe's Odyssey. Another brand new mechanic is that Madokans can now have different emotional states and be affected in different ways, which has an impact on gameplay. In Necron Mines, we come across a lot of blind Madokans, and these differ from your average Madokan because they won't stop moving when you stop because they can't see where you are. And they won't run either, being too afraid of banging into something. This means you'll have to more carefully guide them by using the wait and follow me commands to get them through drills and stop them falling into pits. Whereas a normal Madokan would be much easier to do this with. It's another layer of gameplay and another thing to consider when you're communicating with Madokans and gives a lot more depth to the game speak mechanic. The final new mechanic introduced in the first area of the game is the new vehicle, the minecar. This contraption feels incredibly empowering to use because it can steamroll over bombs and enemies and it's practically indestructible, even gunfire doesn't affect it. It can also roll up walls and even hang upside down on the ceiling, which makes it incredibly useful. If you're rescuing all of the Madokans, it's also used quite interestingly in a few sections where you'll have to position yourself very accurately to avoid killing your friends. Or alternatively, you'll have to move them out of the way by getting out of the minecar and speaking to them before rolling past, which obviously makes you vulnerable to being killed by the sligs who are on patrol. However, the minecar comes at a great cost, for you see, Elam is not present in this game at all and seems to have been replaced by the minecar. We miss you, Elam. <coughs> While this minecar is great and is used in some interesting ways, it's hardly used in the game at all beyond this point. I think we literally see it one more time way, way later in the game, and I find that a bit strange. It almost feels like they used up all of their ideas for it really early on and then didn't really have anywhere to take it. Still though, it's good while it lasts. I will say too that it's slightly odd how this is the only vehicle in the entire game. It would have been really interesting to see other contraptions Abe can use. But maybe that's asking for too much. I mean, the game is already brimming with a ton of content as it is. Adding even more would be insane at this point. You know what? I can't believe the video has been going on this long and we've not even left Necron Mines yet and there's been this much to talk about. I think it's safe to say here that the scope of this game was much greater than Abe's Odyssey, and even though that game had a lot of variety, Exodus has even more. And there's just so much to talk about. But either way, let's finally move on to the next section. So Abe finally makes his way through the mines and rescues all of the Madokans in the area. He then comes across a boiler room and overloads it, activating a timer and starting a timed sequence, which is kinda reminiscent of the end of Abe's Odyssey. Everything starts blowing up and Abe makes it out just in time and ends up in the middle of Necrom itself, 
But he does get a bit of an injury along the way. Necrom is much more naturally themed than the mines and offers a great amount of visual variety and keeps us interested in seeing what other environments are yet to come. While making his way through this section, Abe comes across two new species, Fleechers and Slurgs. Slurgs are basically little blue slugs that pose no threat whatsoever, but they let out a loud squeak when they're stepped on. And why does this matter, you ask? Well, this squeak is loud enough to wake up the Fleechers, which are green, worm-like creatures, and unlike the Slurgs, these pose a massive threat to Abe. Fleechers can swallow Abe whole by grabbing him with the long tongues, which shoot from the mouths when they get too close. After a few licks, they instantly kill Abe by pulling him in, and seemingly crushing him to fit in their small bodies. They can also climb up onto ledges with the tongues, which makes them one of the most manoeuvrable enemies Abe faces. But because he can withstand a few hits before getting killed, they aren't too overpowered, and depending on what other enemies are around, they could even be considered the lowest threat level enemy. But they aren't to be made a joke out of at the same time. We're also introduced to spirit locks, which are devices used by Sligs to imprison the spirits of the dead, who have become restless because of the remains being tampered with. To save these spirits, you simply slap the lock and the spirits then unlock doors for you. This basically mimics the flint lock and bell mechanic from Abe's Odyssey, but is much more streamlined and understandable, which makes it a good change in my opinion. Sometimes rescuing these spirits will also give Abe the ability to temporarily turn invisible by chanting, and you use this in order to get past Fleechers and other enemies undetected. This is used in some tense situations where you just barely make it past enemies before turning visible again, and it's yet another element of variety in level design. However, this ability isn't really directly mentioned in the story of the game, and it's never explained exactly how or why Abe can do this, which I personally find a bit strange. Abe eventually learns that in order to gain the ability to save his sick friends, who luckily survived the explosion back in Necrom Mines, he needs to go through two trials to prove his worth. These trials being going through the Madanshi and the Madomo temples within Necrum, which are burial sites used by two Madokan tribes of the past. If this sounds familiar, it's because Abe's Odyssey basically uses this exact same structure. Just replace rupture farms with Necrum mines, and mosaic lines with Necrum, and then replace Madanshi with Scribania and Madomo with Paramonia, and it's practically the same game. The thing is, despite the core structure being the same at this point, I really don't mind because of how much new content Exodus throws at us within this structure. If this was done with less new mechanics being added, this would probably be a serious problem, but like I say, it's not really a problem at all. As I just mentioned, the Madanshi and Madomo temples are basically Scribania and Paramonia from Abe's Odyssey, only without the outside portions of those levels. And I don't really need to go into too much detail with these areas because of that. However, what I will say is that even when this game is reusing enemies and ideas from the previous game, it still totally gets away with it. And one reason for this is because the level design is substantially different to Odyssey. Exodus having quick save means it can be much faster paced and exciting, while Odyssey was deliberate and slow paced. Which isn't bad by any means, but what it does mean is that each game really does have its own individual identity. Another huge difference with these areas is that in Abe's Exodus, you have the ability to possess Paramites and Scrabs. Whereas in Odyssey, the only creatures you could possess were the Sligs. The scrabs are quite simple to use and basically are just used to mow down any other scrabs or any fleechers in your way. However, the paramites are a bit more interesting and actually have the ability to talk to each other with their own version of game speak. Using this, they can get other paramites to follow them, pull switches for them, and help to attack other enemies too. But on top of that, Paramites are a lot more acrobatic, being able to jump long distances and go up and down webs too. This introduces some really interesting levels where you need to go through long obstacle courses as a Paramite to reach somewhere that only a Paramite could get to. 
And I do actually think they could have done a bit more with this, even though they do do quite a lot with it anyway. It's just really cool, and I think it's a little bit of a shame that we don't see Paramites or Scrabs ever again after we get past this point of the game. But anyway, Abe completes the trials and is greeted by the three ghosts from earlier who give him a scar on his chest as a reward. Jeez, what is with people in these games rewarding you by giving you scars? First Big Face and now these three weirdos are at it. Having said that, the games do actually go back and forth on whether these marks are actually scars or whether they're tattoos. But still, Abe didn't ask for these tattoos, he's just being forced into it. So with this chest tattoo, or scar, or whatever it is, Abe is now able to use the spirit rings to heal Madokans who are sick from brew. Actually reading into this, it doesn't really make much sense. Like, why would completing these ancient Madokan trials grant the ability to heal a sickness which has only just been created with this new beverage? I feel like maybe this is just a bit of a cop-out story element, just so they could have a Paramite and Scrab temple in the game. But still, whatever. It's not too big of a problem, I guess. Abe is then asked by the three ghosts to shut down Soulstorm Brewery, the company behind the mining project in Necrum and that manufactures Soulstorm Brew, and to convince him, he's told about how the Gluckens are getting Madokans hooked on the drink in order to manipulate them into working for them to earn more brew and basically being forced into slave labour in a similar way to how he was. This is perhaps drawing parallels to drug dealing and addiction, and is yet another element of reflecting our own world through Oddworld. That is, on top of the criticism of rampant consumerism, environmental destruction, and the general exploitation done by the bourgeoisie and the ignorant acceptance of the proletariat. Whoa, I didn't intend on getting so deep there. Let's carry on with video games, shall we? So Abe finally rescues his friends from the start of the game, and then gets on a little train cart to infiltrate a central hub area called Fico Depot, which has a direct train line to Soulstorm Brewery. It's here where we're told to switch game discs, because yep, this game is so goddamn big that it couldn't fit on one disc. What other platformer can you think of that's too big of an experience to fit on a single disc? I mean, that should tell you how big of a game this is. I would probably say that this is where the game starts to come into its element. Up until now, the game's followed the same structure as Abe's Odyssey, but here, it starts to feel a bit more original. Fico Depot is basically a hub area which links to several other levels. But why can't you just go straight to Soulstorm Brewery and get this over with, you ask? Well, three Gluckens who are high-ranking executives of the surrounding businesses attached to Fico are worried that Abe is coming for them. I mean, he has destroyed Rupture Farms and Necrum Mines at this point, so they have a very valid reason to be afraid, to be honest. They decide to put everything on lockdown and require each of their authorization to unlock each security gate individually. And of course, this means that in order to get to Soulstorm Brewery, you'll need all three of their permissions to do so. While in Fico, you're introduced to a new enemy called a Greeter, which is a malfunctioning robot that was supposed to be used as a promotional tool for customers, but instead it started electrocuting everyone it came across to death. So now they've been repurposed as security robots with motion sensors attached basically making them into less predictable motion sensor obstacles than the ones we're used to. I've always absolutely loved the theming of this area. It's a train station, so it has lots of adverts for loads of different products available in Oddworld, which expands the game's universe, and it's got directories indicating where all the different places are that you can visit. And there's also a really nice detail where you learn that Rupture Farms was connected to Fico, but it's blacked out on the directory, and when you find what used to be the entrance to it, it's boarded up and says out of service, which is not only awesome attention to detail, but gives impact to what you achieved in the first game. Like what you did actually affected the game's universe and mattered. There's also a location called Vikers Labs, but it's closed off and says coming soon which turns out to be a teaser for the next game in the Oddworld series, because you never actually end up visiting this location, in this game anyway. I seriously love that, it keeps you thinking of the greater Oddworld universe and hypes you up for this new location, and it was an extremely inventive way of generating interest in the next game, before the internet was mainstream. 
Before we move on to the next areas of the game, one new mechanic that's introduced here is that Abe can actually drink Soulstorm Brew, and this gives him the ability to let out explosive farts. This is not only funny and offers even more interesting puzzles based around this, but it's made even more absurd by the fact that you can possess your exploding farts and freely fly them around as a floating remote bomb. Wow, that's a sentence I never thought I would say. It's hilarious and adds a lot to the gameplay, but it's another example of where I feel like the gameplay is a bit disjointed with the lore of the game. Like, why is Abe able to drink Soulstorm Brew now without becoming addicted to it, and yet any other Madokan instantly gets hooked? It doesn't make sense, and it feels a bit disjointed, because I feel like the get out clause of, oh, we can do this because he's the chosen one, is being used far, far too much at this point. Speaking of the game's humour, whereas in Abe's Odyssey this was more in the background and the humour was fairly subtle, I feel like they rarely established the tone that the next games would follow with Abe's Exodus. While still utilising dark humour, I feel like because of the fact there's a lot more cutscenes and characters, Exodus is capable of bringing the humour more to the forefront of the experience, and nowhere is that more apparent than in the Magog on the March news sections, which Abe can tune into by interacting with TV sets spread throughout Fico. These news snippets have a slig host who basically spreads propaganda about Abe being a terrorist, but it's done in a very light-hearted way and features interviews with the three Gluckens we saw earlier in the game, which gives them more characterization. No mamby pamby mudaki me puppet is gonna make me look like a fool. We'll have that traitor Abe in no time. Or my name ain't that. Uh, uh. That's terrific, sir. Terrific. I knew that. I, I did, I knew Brought that. to you by Mullix Maplu. Say it, don't spray it. I think this was the first video game series I ever played that had swearing in it. Although it is mild, I remember it being quite shocking at the time, because I think games were still seen as being for kids, and for a game to then come out that has mild swearing and this much symbolic subtext, kind of made the Oddworld series stand out from the competition. Director Fleg reports bone production down. Ow! It ain't my fault! It's that Abe guy! First rupture thumbs, now necromines! There ain't no bones anywhere! No bones, no brew! I am totally screwed! My career is over! <laughs> and it's all that blue bastard's fault! to you by scrap cakes. Mm -mm. They'll cost you an arm and a leg. Moving on from Fico, we can choose to either go to Boneworks, run by Director Flegg, or the Slig Barracks, run by General Drippick. Boneworks is sort of a slog temple area, similar in design to the Scrab and Paramite temples from earlier, but it heavily utilises slogs and a new puppy slog, aptly named a sloggy. Sloggies are literally just smaller versions of slogs that aren't quite as fast, and with good timing can be jumped over. They don't really add that much to the game to be honest, but still, they're cute so they get away with it. As you would expect, the Slig Barracks is basically a Slig Temple area, featuring a new enemy called the Crawling Slig, which is literally just a Slig, but without its mechanical pants or helicopter pack, therefore making them pathetic just crawling around on the floor helplessly. It's cool seeing them like this because it sort of gives Sligs a bit more background. From this you can kind of assume that the reason Sligs are so loyal to Gluckens is because without the Gluckens industrialization, the Sligs would be pathetic creatures that are completely helpless. But with the Gluckens, they become one of the most feared creatures we've seen in the games. I like that detail. At the end of Boneworks and the Slig Barracks, we actually get to possess and control Gluckens for the first time in the game. And these sections are really, really cool. You remember how Sligs can control slogs by using their version of GameSpeak, right? That was featured in Abe's Odyssey quite a lot. Well, now in this game, Gluckens can control Sligs in a very similar way by using their version of GameSpeak too. 
This opens the game up to some really inventive level design where you need to navigate a Glucken across a level, but because they don't have arms and can't really do too much, they need a slig to pull levers, operate lifts and kill threats for them. It basically turns into a test of how well you can use game speak quickly and efficiently. And plus, when you walk as a Glucken it makes this tune, which just that alone makes it worth the struggle to get to this point. Come here. So you've possessed General Drippic and Director Flegg and disabled their security gates, and now you can go to the FICO Executive Office where Vice President Aslik is based. And you get through that, possess Aslik, and finally unlock the way to get to Soulstorm Brewery. It's here where we're introduced to a new Glucken called the Brewmaster, who is the head of Soulstorm Brewery. But to be honest, he's a bit of a weak villain, just because he comes into the game so late, and because of that, he's hardly really featured in the game. If we had seen him throughout the adventure plotting against Abe or something, he might have stood out more. But it's kinda weird because General Drippic, Vice President Aslik and Director Flegg feel much more fleshed out and memorable. But they aren't even the final threat, and Abe kills them before even reaching the brewery. Putting that aside though, Soulstorm Brewery feels like the ultimate test of everything you've learned throughout Abe's Odyssey and Exodus. Practically every single mechanic is reused in this area to put you through your paces, and it's very difficult, but also very rewarding to get through. Something I've not talked about much is the Madokan status effects, which have been present throughout the whole game, but it's here where you really see how difficult they can make puzzles based around them. So we've already spoken about blind Madokans, but there's also angry, wired, depressed, and sick Madokans on top of that. Angry Madokans will lash out and hit other Madokans if they go near them, but they also won't stop pulling levers if they're next to one, which can cause Abe some grief because the lever being pulled might be making his life more difficult by opening trap doors or something similar. The only way to help these Madokans is to get near them and say sorry, which calms them down and allows you to get their attention. Depressed Madokans simply won't do anything you want until you say sorry to them, but as well as this they have a tendency to commit suicide by smacking themselves in the head if they witness something horrible or if you're nasty to them. No. Sick Madokans won't listen to you until you've gotten the healing rings that Abe learns how to use after completing the Madomo and Madanshi vaults earlier in the game. And then finally, wired Madokans have been affected by laughing gas and won't stop following you and running around until you've given them a good old slap to wake them up. It's really interesting seeing how situations that initially look very simple can be completely changed when a Madokan is affected with one of these statuses and they're used extremely effectively in this last part of the game. One of my favourite parts being this bit where you activate a shower, which angers a Madokan who proceeds to hit the Madokan next to him, and it causes a chain reaction and ends up breaking into a full-on fight with a whole line of Madokans. While making your way through Soulstorm Brewery, you come across some Madokans being tortured by having electric blasted into the skulls while they're hung upside down in restraints. And Abe at first has no idea what this is, but after progressing a bit more, he learns that the Brewmaster is torturing Madokans in order to extract their tears, which is the secret ingredient of Soulstorm Brew. But because Abe has rescued so many Madokans, they're not getting as many tears as usual and need to up the voltage of the machines to make it even more painful for the Madokans who are still captive in order to get more tears out of them. This makes the Brewmaster seem absolutely crazy, but also makes us want to hurry up and rescue the Madokans and end the suffering, because it's technically our fault that their torture is getting worse at this point. This Soulstorm Brewery section is absolutely humongous, like seriously, it feels like it's never going to end. You think there's just one temple area with a series of offshoot levels, but then you finish those and enter a second area, so then you finally complete the second series of levels, only to be greeted with a third section. 
And it really puts across how much bigger of a facility this is than any of the places we've visited in Oddworld so far. There was this one level in the middle of all of this where it actually kind of annoyed me because it became uncompletable and I had to start the level all over again. Basically, there's this bit where you need to get a Glucken to activate all of these voice locks. But in order to get the Glucken, you need to get rid of all of the threats to Abe in the area and clear everything out. So you eliminate all of the Sligs and eventually find the Glucken, but then you drop down to this area and you literally can't do anything. There's a lever here, but you can't pull it because you're a Glucken. So you kill the Glucken only to discover that as Abe, you now can't leave the area that you're stuck in, and so can't go and pull the lever yourself because you're trapped. So what it turns out you're supposed to do is when you're killing all of the Sligs, you're not supposed to kill this particular one. Because as the Glucken, you need to get that Slig to pull the lever. But this is a bit stupid and I don't get why we're even given the option of killing this Slig if doing so completely locks us out of continuing. There should have either just been no lever and a Glucken voice lock instead, or a Slig should have spawned in even if you killed it before. Or, when you killed the Glucken and returned to Abe, you should have been able to leave and pulled it yourself. This is particularly annoying because this level is one of the longer levels, and if you quick save after killing the Slig, you've got to restart the whole level and do it from the start again. It's a huge waste of time and it seems like a design oversight. Which is weird because a very similar situation happened back in Abe's Odyssey in the last section of the game too. Anyway, the last part of the game involves you overloading the brewery's boiler and having to escape before a countdown timer reaches zero, just like in Abe's Odyssey. However, this time, the timer is much longer and you have a more complicated level to go through, which makes the process feel way more epic and intense. After escaping just in the nick of time, the final cutscene plays out in which Soulstorm Brewery explodes and the brewmaster perishes in the blast. Abe returns to the Mosaic Lines, and once again, all 399 Madokans he's rescued at this point cheer in celebration. However, Abe becomes aware that there's more Madokans out there that need his help, and he fully settles into his role as a saviour and decides he's not going to stop until he's rescued every last one and stopped the Gluckens once and for all. It's quite an epic conclusion, and I love the imagery of Abe and the other Madokans all putting their hands up to the moon as a symbolic gesture of the spiritual quest. We then get interrupted by a Magog on the March news broadcast, which recaps the story, but from the perspective of the Gluckens, and then we get to see the original Oddworld Inhabitants logo from Abe's Odyssey, which is a nice touch. If you go to the trouble of getting 100% by rescuing all 300 Madokans in the game, you'll be teased with these screens which indicate what's next in the Oddworld series, going as far as to mention the main character of the next game, Munch. And it also says that we'll find out what's going on with Abe's mother too. It's an awesome little hint at things to come and gets us excited for the next game, and on top of that, we also get a look at some amazing concept art too. Then the credits roll and we end on a screen thanking the development team's friends and families. What's weird is that the game ends on this screen and doesn't allow us to go back to the title screen or anything. You literally have to quit the game to get out of this. Meaning that yet again there's no level select and you can't re-watch the concept art video from the main menu either which is a bit of a letdown. There's also no cutscene viewer this time around with any scary videos for us like in the last game, which is fine I guess, but it would have been nice to see this return. Whoa, that was a lot to get through. I seriously wasn't expecting this video to be anywhere near this long. After doing a long video on Abe's Odyssey, I was kinda thinking that by just focusing on the changes Exodus makes, it would be a shorter video, but no. Turns out Abe's Exodus adds a lot more to the original game than I remembered. I'm giving Oddworld Abe's Exodus an 8 out of 10. It's close to being a 9 out of 10, but it has a bit of an issue with the disconnect between the game's lore and the actual gameplay. With stuff like, why is Abe able to drink Soulstorm Brew, and why is he unaffected by the laughing gas? And then there's also stuff like, where did these Madokans come from who give you the healing rings in Soulstorm Brewery? 
I feel like they took a few liberties with putting things into the game for the sake of interesting gameplay, which is fine, but it somewhat contradicts with the game's actual story and causes plot holes and confusion. There's also still a bit of an issue that was present in Abe's Odyssey too, where once you've left an area, you can never go back. Meaning, if you've missed a Madokan, they're gone forever and you're completely locked out of getting 100%. While this is remedied somewhat by the more in-depth Madokan tally charts and the fact that the secrets are much better signposted, it's still an issue and it results in you making a ton of backup save files just in case you mess up, which isn't ideal. Either the game should have had a level select upon completion so you could go back and get Madokans you missed, or it should have been designed so you could backtrack through the whole game. The area near the end of the game where I stopped myself from being able to continue was also a bit of a negative worth pointing out, but at least there's an option to restart the area rather than having to load a previous save, which would have lost a lot of progress. There's also a tiny bit of a nitpick where it could be argued that certain game mechanics are underdeveloped or underutilised, like the minecar, scrabs and paramites, to a degree the sligs are maybe slightly underused too, with there only being one example of talking to a slog and one example of needing to tell a Madokan to look out, but I guess they already did those things a lot in the first game. But then there's also the Shrikel, which makes around four appearances in this game, and to be honest, probably could have just have been cut because it's never even used all that interestingly here and it feels like they just felt inclined to include it just because Abe used it in the first game. Having said all that though, what we have here is basically a better version of Abe's Odyssey that fixes the vast majority of issues with the original game, while also adding loads more content and making it twice as long, if not even longer than that to be honest. It feels like a much more slickly produced game, and really, this is the game that nailed the tone for the series. The graphical quality both in-game and in the cutscenes is impressive to this very day, and I honestly believe that this could be one of the PS1 games that's aged the best out of any. The music and sound design is amazing, with it having slightly more catchy beats and less atmospheric music this time around, which fits because the game has a lot more industrial environments. I mean, just listen to this little jam that plays when you're in the Gluckens' offices. The controls are responsive and very intelligently mapped to the controller in a way that's easy to understand, despite there being so many different playable characters and so many different functions for these characters. It's just a seriously impressive experience to go through and in my opinion is one of the best video game sequels ever made due to what it fixes from the first game and everything it adds on top of that. It's incredible and it's a must-play PS1 game. Something I've not mentioned is how in the original game Abe had four fingers and yet in this game he's got three, and how the Madokan Pop design differs greatly going from Odyssey to Exodus. This is actually quite a complicated story, but both of these things are because of Japan. Basically, in Japan there was a subclass of people that worked in meat packaging and were looked down on in society, and showing four fingers to someone, almost like sticking a middle finger up in Western culture, was seen as calling someone out as being a member of this meat packaging subclass, which was an insult. So any character entering Japan with four fingers either needs to pay a lot of money to avoid legal battles, or alternatively change the design of the character. Oddworld inhabitants didn't have that kind of money to fight the legal battles, and so changed the Madokan designs for this game so he had three fingers. I assume the reason he has this new three-fingered design in all regions for Abe's Exodus is because they wanted his design to be consistent across the world. The reason for the Madokan Pop design change was again because of a horrible event in Japan, where a brutal killing took place where the victim was beheaded, and in order to avoid connections being drawn to this horrible event, Oddworld inhabitants changed this design in order to stop upset or distress in that region. 
and they ended up preferring the altered Madoc and Pop design so much that they kept it in favour of the more gruesome one featured in the first game. I think this was probably a good call to be honest. It's still sinister, but a lot more toned down. And to be honest, in the game's universe, the new Madoc and Pop advert makes it look more appealing as a product anyway. Anyway, that's Oddworld Abe's Exodus, a truly amazing game and one of my favourite games of all time. However, a new console generation was just around the corner and Oddworld inhabitants had to adapt to this upcoming technology and so decided to move the series in a new direction, featuring not only a new main character and not only being an exclusive to the original Xbox, but also it'll mark their first 3D game. So, join me next time for the next part of Oddtober where we're going to be taking a look at Oddworld Muncher's Odyssey.